Tennessee's at-home learning series for literacy. Today's lesson is for all of our seventh graders out there, though anyone is welcome to tune in. This lesson is the fourth in this week's series. My name is Mrs. Alley, and I'm a seventh grade teacher for Tennessee schools. I am so excited to be your teacher for today's lesson. Welcome to my virtual classroom. If you didn't see our previous lessons, you can find them at www.tn.gov education. If you haven't seen any of our previous lessons, you can still tune in to today's lesson, but it might be more fun if you go back and watch our previous lessons as we will be talking about learning we've done in our other lessons. Today, we will be learning about a short story called His Motto. It was written by a woman named Lottie Burrell Dixon during the Harlem Renaissance. Before we get started to participate fully in our lesson today, you will need a few things. Paper, pencil, a hard surface to write on, and the student packet for grade seven ELA lesson 19, which can be found at www.tn.gov education. Today, we will use the short story, His Motto, to build knowledge about life during the early 1900s and focus on how setting, characters, and plot interact to tell a story. We have been studying the Harlem Renaissance period, a time in the 1920s and 1930s in the United States, where there was a growth of intellectual, literary, and artistic work from African Americans. Last time we read and analyzed a poem by Georgia Douglas Johnson titled, called Dreams. We learned that in the poem, Johnson told a story of a speaker who wanted to pursue her dreams despite other forces trying to stop her, and that with determination, she would overcome any obstacle. She used structural techniques such as writing in couplets and rhymes to emphasize different ideas. Her use of precise word choices like contraband and morning break conveyed negative or positive feelings to develop the themes. Today our goal is to continue our study of the Harlem Renaissance by reading part one of a short story that takes place in the same time period. We will focus on the characters and setting and how these elements affect the plot. We will begin with me showing you what that looks like and then there will be time for you to practice on your own with my support. Finally, I will assign independent work that you can complete once the video ends. Before we begin reading, I will give you some background information because it will help us understand some basic things in the story that we may, may be unfamiliar with. Remember, this story takes place about 100 years ago, so the world was different. This story takes place before the use of telephones or internet, and characters will use the telegraph to communicate. Before the telephone, people use, could send messages along wires using electrical pulses. Operators on either end received the messages either by listening to a series of beeps or operating a printer that decoded these beeps. You might have heard of the Morse code, long and short beeps. Here is a picture of what that looked like. There were also wireless systems, which could send messages using radio waves, and these were especially useful in the regular telegraph lines were not usable. This is what it looked like. Also, part of this story is set in Maine. The setting of Maine has many rural and natural areas to visit, which is very different from New York City. Therefore, when one of the main characters, Dermont, leaves New York for Maine, he is going to a very different kind of community. Here are two images to show you the difference between the two settings. Let's create a note catcher to capture the key details about the setting, characters, and plot, since we want to focus today on how those elements interact to help us understand the story. On one page, I will make my note catcher like this. You can use the whole page to draw your note catcher so that you have plenty of space. Be sure to make four rows under character and description. Thank you. 
On another paper, make note catcher like this. Yes, that is all for the note catcher. I'll show you in a bit what to do to track the plot. Now we are ready to begin the story, his motto. Do you know what a motto is? It's a phrase or sentence that captures some guiding beliefs or values about how someone lives their life. Here are some mottos that you may have heard of or seen before. You only live one. Live, laugh, love. Keep calm and carry on. Be yourself or dream big. The title of the story is His Motto. So I'm thinking whatever that motto is will be important to understand the central ideas and themes of the story. Okay, let's get started. But I can't leave my business affairs and go off on a fishing trip now. The friend and Dumont's doctor who had tricked John Dumont into a confession of physical bankruptcy and made him submit to an examination in spite of himself now sat back and an I wash my hands of you gesture. So what is going on here? There are two people, a specialist and John Dermont. I think a specialist here is some sort of doctor because he did an examination on John Dermont. So that means John Dermont doesn't want to go fishing even though he confessed he had physical bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is when you have no money left. So physical bankruptcy means that John Dermont has no strength, energy. That makes sense. Dermont is stressed and exhausted from his business. I washed my hands of you is a saying that means I'm not responsible for what happens now because the doctor has already said Dermont needs a break. Let's keep reading. Very well, you can either go to Maine now at once or you'll go to, well, as I'm only your spiritual advisor, my progno prognostications as to your ultimate destination would probably have very little weight with you. Oh, well, if you are so sure, I suppose I can cut loose now, if it comes to a choice like that. The doctor smiled his satisfaction. So you prefer to bear the ills of New York than to fly to others you know not of, huh? Oh, have a little mercy on Shakespeare, at least. I'll go. The doctor says he has prognostications or predictions about what Dermont's ultimate destination will be if he doesn't go to Maine. Since Dermont is stressed out, if he doesn't take this vacation, he might get worse and die. That makes him agree to take a vacation to Maine after all. Let's pause and make a couple of notes about the characters. We have John Dermont, who is a stressed and exhausted businessman who needs a break, and the specialist who is concerned about Dermont's health and wants him to take a vacation. I'll jot this down under characters. Take a moment to jot these notes on your note catcher. This seems like a good place to write a significant event. The dialogue between Dermont and the specialist causes Dermont to travel to Maine, where the rest of this story takes place. I'll add this to my plot map, making sure to be as brief and clear as possible. And thus, it was that a week later found Dermont as deep in the main woods as he could get and still be within reach of a telegraph wire. And much to his surprise, he found he liked it. As he lay stretched at full length on the soft turf, the breath of the pines filled his lungs. The lure of the lake made him eager to get to his fishing tackle, and he admitted to himself that a man needed just such a holiday as this in order to keep his mental and physical 
balance. Dermot sounds like he is glad he took this break. But you know what? I notice he still wants to be near a telegraph wire, probably to communicate with the business since he probably still worries about what's going on there. Let's write the setting on our note catcher. Returning to the gaily painted frame building called by courtesy the hotel, which nestled among the pines, he met the youthful operator from the nearby station looking for him with a message from his broker. A complicated situation had arisen in amalgamated copper and an immediate answer was needed. Dermont had heavy investments in copper, though his business was the manufacturer of electrical instruments. He walked back to the office with the operator while pondering the answer. Then having written it, handed it to the operator saying, tell them to rush the answer. Well, that didn't take long for his vacation to be interrupted. There's some sort of issue at Amalgamated Copper, which was a mining company at the time. So now he must get a message back to them through the telegraph. I'm going to add this new setting. The tall, lank youth, whose every movement was a protest against being hurried, dragged himself over to the telegraph key. S open. What's open? Wire. Well, is that the only wire you have? Yep. What in the world am I going to do about this message? Dunno. Maybe it will close bim my. And the young lighting slinger pulled towards him a lurid tale of the Wild West and proceeded to enjoy himself. Wow, the telegraph isn't working because the wire is open, meaning it isn't connected. And the youth in the office doesn't seem to be a useful sort of person. Kind of lazy and unhelpful if you ask me. The author says here that he dragged himself and his movement showed he didn't want to hurry. And at the end, he just sits back to read a story. And meanwhile, what do you suppose is going to happen to me? Thundered Dermont. Haven't you ambition enough to look around your wire and see if you can find the trouble? Line man's paid to look up trouble. I'm not, was the surly answer. Line, line man's paid to look up trouble. I'm not, was the surly or irritable answer. Dermont is really angry now. He accuses the youth of having no ambition. Ambition is the motivation and desire to improve. Let's add this youth character to our note catcher. I'll give you a moment. Now jot this plot point on your note catcher. Notice I am drawing an arrow between the events to show how the plot progresses. Remember to write the words before drawing the box. Dermot was furious, but what he was about to say was cut off by a quiet voice at his elbow. I noticed linemen repairing wires upon the main road. That's where the wire is open. If you have any message you are in a hurry to send, perhaps I can help you out. Dermont turned to see a colored boy of 15 whose entrance he had not noticed. Ooh, there's a new character, a 15-year-old African-American boy offering to help Dermont send his message. Dermont didn't even notice him coming because he was so engrossed in his argument with the youth. Let's read what happens. What can you do about it? He asked contemptuously. Take it into town in an ox team? 
I can send it by wireless if that is sufficiently quick. Dermont turned to the operator at the table. Is there a wireless near here? He owns one. You'll have to do business with him on that, said the youth with a grin on Dermont's unconcealed prejudice. It would be hard to estimate the exact amount of respect, mingled with surprise, with which the city man now looked at the boy whose information he had evidently doubted till confirmed by the white boy. I'm kind of impressed with this young boy because he talks calmly and respectfully to Dermont, even though Dermont didn't take him seriously just because he's black. It's only when the white boy or the white youth told him he would have to talk to the black boy about the wireless telegraph that Dermont understands the boy was telling the truth. I'm going to jot some of this down about the characters. For Dermont, he is prejudiced against the African-American boy. This is disappointing, but it seems to be consistent with what we were learning earlier this week about the Great Migration and the Harlem Renaissance. African-Americans weren't treated fairly and there was a lot of discrimination against them. And despite Dermont's unkindness, the boy is quiet and seems helpful. Oh, but I don't know his name yet. I guess for now, I'll just write African-American boy until I find out. Go ahead and write down these notes. Suppose you've got some kind of tomfool contraption that will take half a day to get a message into the next village. Here I stand to lose several thousands because this blame company runs only one wire down this camp. Where's this apparatus of yours? Might as well look at it while I'm waiting for this one wire office to get into commission again. It's right up on top of the hill, answered the colored boy. Here, George, I brought down this wireless book if you want to look it over. It's better worth reading than that stuff you have there and tossing a book on the table, he went out, followed by Dermont. A couple of minutes walk brought them in sight of the 60-foot aerial erected on the top of a small shack. How do you think Dermont feels now? I agree. He's still looking down at the boy. He calls the boy's wireless telegraph a tomfool contraption, like it's some sort of ridiculous toy. There's still no respect here, even though Dermont reluctantly goes to see the wireless telegraph. Just more evidence of his prejudice. Let's continue. It's right up on top of the hill, answered the colored boy. Here, George, I brought down this wireless book if you want to look it over. It's better worth reading than that stuff you have there. And tossing a book on the table, he went out, followed by Dermont. Hmm. I wonder if Dermont realizes at this point that the boy knows how to read. We know this because he gives George, the white youth, a book about wireless telegraphs. I wonder if that's how the boy learned how to use a wireless telegraph. A couple of minutes walk brought them inside of the 60 foot aerial erected on the top of a small shack. Not much to look at, but I made it all myself. On the right side, there is an image of what this aerial could have looked like. What does it remind you of? Yes, it reminds me of a cell phone tower or electricity tower, and this was over 100 years ago. Can you imagine this on top of a small shack? It's pretty impressive. Let's finish up part one of our story. How did you happen to construct this? And Dermont really tried to keep the emphasis of the you. Well, I'm interested in all kinds of electrical experiments and have kept up reading and studying ever since I left school then, when I came out here on my uncle's farm, he let me rig up this wireless, and I can talk to a chum of mine down in the city. And when I saw the wire at the station was gone up, I thought I might possibly get your message to New York through him. What new information have you learned about the characters in this part of the story? Take a minute to jot down some thoughts. Did you add something like this? thinking the same thing, that the boy is proud of himself because he built the wireless telegraph and tower by himself. 
and he uses it to talk to friend, a friend in New York. No wonder he thought he could help Dermont. Anything else you thought of? Okay, so you notice Dermont might be trying to be nicer because the text says he tried not to emphasize you. Yes, it sounds different to say, how did you happen to construct? Because that sounds like you don't believe the boy is capable of doing something so amazing. Maybe we'll find out tomorrow. Take a moment to finish up any notes for this section. Let's look at our plot map. Oh, we only have two events here and it doesn't include the part we just read. So what's the main event that happened here? Right, a black boy offers to help Dermont deliver his message and Dermont reluctantly agrees to go with him. Add that to the plot map. A black boy offers to help Dermont deliver his message and Dermont reluctantly agrees to go with him. It should look like this. Now that we finished reading part one, let's go back and consider more carefully the interactions between the characters, setting, and plot. These elements all work together to tell a story. Here's the first scene of the story. But I can't leave my business affairs and go off on a fishing trip now. The friend and specialist who had tricked John Dermont into a confession of physical bankruptcy and made him submit to an examination in spite of himself now sat back with an I wash my hands of you gesture. Very well, you can either go to Maine now at once or you'll go to, well, as I'm only your spiritual advisor, my prognostication as to your ultimate destination would probably have very little weight with you. Oh well, if you are so sure, I suppose I can cut loose now if it comes to a choice like that. The doctor smiled his satisfaction. So you prefer to bear the ills of New York than to fly to, uh, to others you know not of, huh? Oh, have a little mercy on Shakespeare, at least. I'll go. How does conversation between Dermot and his doctor influence the plot? To answer this question, I want you to think about the content of the conversation and how it causes events to happen. In this scene, the doctor shares his worries about Dermont's health due to his work. In fact, he's concerned Dermont might even die, which is what finally persuades Dermont to take a vacation. So the conversation is the spark that causes Dermont to even be in an isolated place, Maine. The main setting of the story, in the first place, to relax. Take a minute to write down this question and answer. Notice my answer doesn't have to be extensive at this point. I just wrote, the conversation causes Dermont to take a vacation to Maine to relax. In scene two, Dermont needs to send a message to his broker in New York, but finds out the telegraph wire is broken. What is the use reaction to Dermont's situation? This scene is too long to show on one page, so you may need to consult your note catcher for clues so you can write your response. Good work on consulting your notes. Your response should look similar to this. At first, the youth is just lazy and unhelpful, but then he becomes surly when Dermont insists that he fix the wire. This is the part of the story where the African-American boy is introduced. What is Dermont's reaction to the African-American boy's offer to help? Write your response after consulting your notes and scanning. Great job. Dermont is contemptuous and sarcastic about the boy having to take an ox team to New York. He seems prejudiced against the boy because he's black. How does the African-American boy's offer to help affect the plot? 
Dumas, despite his prejudice, agrees to come with him to deliver the message. It might give him a chance to change his mind about the boy. Last question for today. Why is the setting important to the plot? Consult your note catcher to help you answer this question. The setting of Maine is important because it is isolated with a few options to communicate. When Germain can't send his message by telegraph, he must find another way. So he is forced to interact with the black boy. We are just about out of time today. Thank you so much for taking a deep dive into part one of his motto with me. I have one more thing I'd like to ask you to do today. For independent practice, after the episode, write some ideas about this question. What possible themes do you see emerging in the text so far? Students, please copy down the independent practice so that you have the assignment when the video ends. You have your note catcher that has your notes about the setting, characters, and plot, and you can use it to brainstorm possible themes. Remember, a theme is the message that the author wants to convey to you, the reader. I'm sure you have plenty of ideas so far, and we'll see you next time to learn what happens in the rest of the story. I enjoyed working on his motto with you today. Thank you for inviting me into your home. I look forward to seeing you next time on Tennessee's At Home Learning Series. Bye.